Okay, before we begin, would somebody please open us in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you very much for gathering us all here, Heavenly Father, first class, Heavenly Father. Bless each and every person present here, Heavenly Father, and help us to learn uh, new things from my Heavenly Father. Use my might, Heavenly Father, teach us new things about your word, Heavenly Father, and lead us mightily in this class, Heavenly Father. Please help us understand the chapters that she's taking today, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we are just coming to the end of the chapter on Paul's life. Uh, we were looking through the book of Acts. So coming to the, we finished the book of Acts. So we we'll look a little bit at Paul's life post Acts. So uh, Acts covered up to uh, Paul's imprisonment in Rome. Uh, but after that, it doesn't talk about what happened after. So we look at what happens after that, and then we'll go into the early church. Um, so in AD 63 was when uh, Paul was released from Roman imprisonment. And then we, uh, some of the things that he did after that are things that we are able to see based on what he said in other books. So the book of Titus, the book of First and Second Timothy, uh, which are considered the pastoral epistles. Uh, those epistles have some information about what he did after that. Um, let me just share screen. Uh, just, yeah, I have it on a PowerPoint, so I'll just share that. Okay, so this is um, some places that Paul visited um, after he was released from Rome. So from Rome, he um, is thought to have gone to Crete, uh, which he talks about in the book of Titus. Um, if we look at Titus 1.5, um, can someone look at that? Read Titus 1.5. Titus chapter 1 verse 5. Yeah. For this reason, I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. OK. So we see here that Paul um, has taken more of a role of just overseeing the work. So we'll also see Timothy, where Timothy has taken charge of the church, the work in Ephesus. So Titus is now taking, uh, he's kind of overseeing what's happening in Crete. Uh, and he is put in charge of appointing the leaders in the church. Um, so Paul is now going to, um, he's kind of stepping back uh, and just overseeing the work of uh, these leaders that he's already raised. Um, so he leaves. Titus in Crete, and then he moves on from there. Um, you all can see the map, right? Yeah. So uh, the rest of it, like, it's not very certain, all of the things he did. It may be that he went to Ephesus with Timothy. So if someone can read Timothy 1.3. Yes. So here it's uh, possible that he actually went, so if you look on the map also, he went to Ephesus with Timothy, and then from Ephesus, he continued on into Macedonia. Um, and left 
Timothy there, like he did Titus, he left Timothy in Ephesus uh, to kind of make sure that uh, the people were learning what is true and were, he was uh, opposing anyone who was teaching anything that was not in line with what Paul had uh, taught them. Um, so one season Macedonia is where he writes First Timothy, he writes Titus, and uh, possibly also Hebrews uh, is thought to have been written by him. So all those books while he's in Macedonia. So from there, he's encouraging Timothy in the work that he is doing in Ephesus and encouraging Titus in the work that he's doing in Crete. Um, and then he asks Titus uh, to come meet him in Nicopolis. So um if you see from macedonia he goes on to nicopolis on the map you can see he goes down to corinth and then nicopolis and he asked titus to come meet him there okay and it may be that he also he had intent uh, earlier if you remember we read about him wanting to go to spain so in this time he might have also gone on to spain um So, if someone can read Second Timothy four ten, having loved the written word and has departed from Thessalonica, Stephen's. Uh, for Galatia, Titus, Titus for Dalmatia. Okay, so he's um, Titus went on to Dalmatia. Uh, that is in, if you look in the map, that um, Illyricum that's on the left there, yeah, near the Adriatic Sea. So that's where Titus went uh, from create and left the work to uh, Tychicus. So in Titus 3.12, we see that some other people came and started doing the work in Crete, and then Titus moves on to Dalmatia. Um, so finally, from here, uh, Paul is once again imprisoned in Rome, okay, from 67 to 68 AD. And uh, this is where he... Uh, is thought to have finally been martyred, uh, to have been uh, beheaded because he's a Roman citizen. So that was the way they would um, kind of uh, treat Roman prisoners. So it was not a painful death, or thought to not be as painful a death as uh, crucifixion or um, other kinds of treatment. So we'll read uh, these last few passages because they are the end of his ministry. Uh, 2 Timothy 4, 6 to 22. And for me, the hour has not for me to be sacrificed. The time is near for me to leave his life. I have done my best in the military, I have done the true mission, and I have kept the faith. And now there is waiting for us to be the pride of the pride of being put right with God, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day when I pay. And not only to me, but to all those who wait for us to keep his love for his own care. Do your best to come to me soon. They will spend an hour with his present world and has deserted me. Going on to Thessalonica, Christians went to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me, get drunk and drink it with me, because he can help me in the work. I send Titus uh, and the Thessalonians. When you come, uh, bring my report by an empty cross with Titus, bring the books too, and especially the ones made of parchment. I send the metal workers, did the everything uh, much harm. The Lord is rewarded according to what he has done. Be on your guard against him yourself, because he was wise and he was wisely according to our message. No one should by me the first time I defended myself or the me. May God not counter against us. But the Lord speaketh me and gave me strength, 
that I was able to proclaim the full message for all the Gentile speakers, and I was rescued from being sentenced to death. And the Lord would rescue me from all evil and take me safely to into his heavenly kingdom. Then be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, final readings. I send readings to Priscilla and Aquila and to the families of, of uh, Onis, Onis uh, Erastus, Erastus, stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophilus uh, in Miletus because he was left. They are best to come before we are Tibulus, Tulens, Linus, and Claudia send their greetings, and so do all the other Christian brothers. The Lord be with your spirit. God bless you with your honor. So this is um, when he is imprisoned in Rome, right? So this is his final imprisonment. He writes to Timothy in the letter of Second Timothy, and uh, his death is he knows it's coming soon, and so he's just writing this final letter. Um, we see here um, just this really important statement: "I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I've kept the faith." Uh, very important thing. So I've continued to battle for God's kingdom, right? Uh, I finished whatever God had purposed for me. Okay. And third is I remain faithful to God. So those are some three important things uh, that if we look at uh, the Israelites in the Old Testament, where God had told them to conquer the land, uh, did they go and take everything that God had given them? No, because they got happy with whatever they had and they just settled and they started to merge with the culture around them. So that's the difference where God has called us to take his entrusted um, certain uh, places to us for us to take over for his kingdom. And uh, when he's saying, I fought the good fight, he's battled for that. Right? He very much entered a battle in so many ways, like physically traveling to all of these places, being persecuted, being imprisoned, uh, all of these things. It was a spiritual and a physical battle. He completed that. He finished whatever God had, like he reached the finish line of the race. He didn't stop in between somewhere. He went right to the end of the race. And throughout that, he continued to stay strong in his faith. He didn't, uh, that is the key, right? That was what that kept him going even in the midst of the battle. Uh, so three things for us to take away as uh, people who are called for God's work in whatever way that may look like. Uh, three things that God calls us to is to fight uh, for what he has given us, uh, to finish it and to stay strong through that race, uh, to hold on to the faith through that race. Uh, and then he lists uh, a whole lot of people who were involved in the work with him, some people who uh, mistreated him, some people who forsook him, uh, some people who had continued the work that he was doing. He'd entrusted work to them, and they were continuing the work that he had started. Um, so we see a lot of people named, uh, and he ends the letter with that. Um, so we'll just look at what were the things that Paul achieved as someone who uh, he experienced God powerfully and then carried that experience into his ministry to carry on, to pass on that revival? Um, uh, we'll just look at a summary of that. So Paul ministered from AD 44 to 68, so about 20 to 24 years of ministry in all. In that, he covered uh, about 49 cities in Asia Minor and Europe, and traveled over 10,000 miles by land only. So by sea, he traveled uh, several thousand miles in addition to that. Um, he established churches in several places, and those churches uh, are recorded to have experienced the Holy Spirit in power. Right? They experienced God moving amongst them. Uh, he raised up many leaders and fellow workers with him. There are about 24 people who are named uh, in the New Testament. 
uh, he impacted people across cultures, across social lines. Uh, he um, impacted people from different parts of society. So he went to the philosophers, he went to the people in the marketplace, went to different groups of people. He went to leaders, right? When he was imprisoned, he was preaching to leaders. So he went to groups of people from all over, to the Jews, to the Gentiles, uh, to the poor, to the rich, to the elite, uh, all of these people that he was able to present the gospel to them uh, in ways that made sense to them. And he, so he contextualized it, but always in the power of the Holy Spirit, not uh, just with words. Um, and then uh, he wrote uh, yeah, 13 or 14 epistles uh, that are recorded in the New Testament. So apart from this, he also wrote other things, but these are the ones that are in the New Testament. Um, so things that we can learn from him is uh, how we can seek God so passionately, right? Uh, to be people who are pursuing God, pursuing a personal revival so that God can move powerfully through us. Uh, to be people who can prepare other people to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. So uh, in the way we raise leaders, in the way we plant uh, new communities of believers, and all of that to be preparing people to receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, to be people who can pass on that fire of the Holy Spirit wherever we are going. So wherever we are going to be carrying the power of the Holy Spirit and uh, allowing people around us to experience that. Um, and then to be able to influence um, wherever we are, wherever we are going to be able to influence those communities uh, for Christ. So anything you all want to share from what we've covered in Acts? Any takeaways? Uh, Ma'am, yeah. uh, the churches that uh, uh, the churches that were made, right, are they there even now, or uh, are they not there? Are they like physical church, like physical churches, or just like you went to various houses and they? Yeah, so there were no physical buildings constructed. Uh, they were all house churches at okay. this time. Uh, so we can't go visit the physical buildings, <laughs> but uh, the work definitely continued, right? Whatever. Uh, so that's the thing. That's the difference, I think, between a physical structure and a spiritual work that's done. Uh, we'll never know the impact of what, like, he impacted those few people, but how many people did those people impact? And where did all those people go? They spread all over the world, right? Yeah. So we might be meeting someone somewhere else completely in the world who actually was impacted because of that work in some place in Asia Minor or some place in Europe. Um, but definitely the churches in those places also have continued as well. There are believers all over the world uh, because of what started there and what spread from there. So. Yeah. It's like a very small group of people. Or, uh, when he was writing to those churches, uh, the congregations, we don't have specific numbers, or maybe we do, but it's not mentioned in the New Testament. Uh, but all the letters that were written, even if they were written to one church, were usually passed on to the other churches. Uh, so even the New Testament. Uh, I, we'll cover a little bit of that later. When the New Testament was finalized, it was already letters that everyone was aware of. The churches were already like talking about the things that were written in these epistles. So the same things that were already being taught and uh, being spoken about were just finalized as this is going to be our, um, our scripture that we are going to um, adopt for the church. Now, the letters that Paul wrote and he sent, right, ma'am, now were they just read out or were they like, uh, like how we have uh, this book written by Pastor Ashish? Was mm -hmm. it like you have a teacher like you and then they're telling how what they understood from this and towards the class? Was it like that? Or just like what is written there exactly just read out to the crowd? Uh, as far as we know, it was probably just read, but I'm sure there was some like 
we can't just read the scripture by ourselves and fully understand right we yeah. do depend on people who know more than us to help us understand it in the same way which is why he was raising up leaders he was raising up timothy and titus and other people who were going with him who would understand what he was communicating and be able to help the church understand it better so i'm sure that as they were reading it they were also like expounding on what was said in the letters okay yeah Any questions from those online or anything you'll want to share? Just like takeaways from we covered a lot of content from Acts. So, okay, we can uh, move on then from there. Oh, can you tell about this? Uh... This Antioch, uh, which happened between this Barnabas and Paul, little more, like what made them actually to go apart? Okay. Division. Uh, so all we know is whatever is recorded in scripture. Uh, so from scripture, all um, we can go back to that section. So that's at the end of the first. Uh, that's the start of the second missionary journey, right? Um, so we can go back there and look a little bit at those passages. Mm, let me just open that. Yeah, so uh, we can open it in Acts to look at what. Um, I don't think the this dispute is actually recorded there. Let's just see. Okay, so I'm going to act 15. Yeah, Acts 15. Um, maybe I can just read it. Y'all can open to it for sure. Acts 15 verse 1 says, uh, certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom uh, taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Um, okay, so this is where uh, Paul and Barnabas uh, disagree with them, and then they go into Jerusalem. Uh, then they come back to the church, and then from verse 36 onwards in chapter 15, um, sometime later Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them, but Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and they left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Okay, so um, so Mark was related to Barnabas, and so in that first journey when they went, uh, it was the three of them, right, going. And we, when we looked at the map, they went to about three places, and then they went to Pamphylia, and then uh, Mark left them from Pamphylia and went back to Jerusalem. Now, we don't know why Mark left them, okay, but... Um, what is said here is he deserted them, which means he kind of abandoned them. It was not like he uh, had to leave. It was an emergency. Uh, we don't know for sure. But what is recorded here is like in the middle of the ministry, he just decided he was going to go for whatever reason. Um, but it was almost like he left them by themselves and went off on his own way. It was not a good partition, at least with Paul. We don't know with Barnabas. So because Barnabas viewed Mark as he was a relative and a younger uh, person, he could accept that and continue to care for Mark 
recognizing, okay, whatever it was a mistake or it was a weakness or whatever it was, I'll continue to, I'll give him another chance. Uh, but from Paul's perspective, it was like he had failed in that mission. Um, and because he had not been faithful to the team, uh, Paul was not happy with taking him along. Uh, so uh, I think Barnabas and Mark had a relationship where Paul didn't have that family relationship with him. Uh, so maybe there was more loyalty that Barnabas had towards Mark than Paul felt. Yeah, so the whole disagreement was because of Mark. So. There's not, no, none of that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the uh, main issue was that Mark had come in the, Mark had gone with them. Paul was not happy with Mark. Barnabas had some loyalty towards Mark and wanted him to continue in the work. Uh, because Barnabas wanted Mark to go along, Paul refused to continue ministry with them. Oh, day journey, it's not there, ma'am, or? Uh... Yeah, there's no more about Barnabas uh, or oh, okay. Mark's work in Acts after that. But uh, but Barnabas does continue to work, and uh, Paul does continue to show respect towards Barnabas. So that's what we see in First Corinthians, where he refers to. So he does have respect towards Barnabas. Uh, and Mark also continues to do work, and he shows respect towards Mark also. Like he recognizes Mark's work. So even uh, the passage we just read in Second Timothy, at the end of his uh, ministry and life, that last letter that he's writing, he mentions Mark in it. So something changed over time. So he, he might have seen Mark's change, and that Mark continued in the ministry, and then he kind of uh, was willing to accept him back. Um, but at that time, there was he was unhappy about whatever Mark did. So. Yeah. Uh, Faster, so about um, <clears throat> Paul um, in Acts chapter twenty-one, verse. Um, verse uh 10 like where this prophet he comes and tells uh, paul that uh something's gonna happen to you if you go to rome and all that mm -hmm. so then uh, why does why does he um like go against it because it, he's a prophet so it's mm -hmm. the holy spirit that's speaking god speaking through him mm -hmm. so uh is it like he disobeyed god or was he overconfident <laughs> Verse 21, verse 10, 10 to 14. You can take the mic. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, Paul's response is there in verse 13. Um, he says, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So Paul's goal here was clear that um, whatever was going to happen to him, he was willing to let it happen. So uh, we also read, um, I don't remember the reference and we can look it up, but uh, where he talks about before I enter every city, people warn me that there's going to be persecution, that there's going to be trouble. So he always knew that it was coming. Um, so here also he's like, I know that this, if it's going to come, let it come, but I'm going to continue the work. I'll go do what I've purposed to do. And if uh, it means that death is, what is awaiting me in Jerusalem, then it's fine. So he was willing to die. But that was not the time that he died, right? He still he still had so many more years of ministry even after that. Uh, at every city, we, I'll tell you, we actually covered that.
Mm. Can you read that out, please? Oh, uh, Mike. Please, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. Uh, Acts 18 10. Oh. Okay, I'll find the verse, and uh, tomorrow we can look at it. Okay, so. Yeah, anything? Which was all written by the Paul. It's like, it's the exact prints we have in Bible now. Whatever Paul wrote, is it? Mm -hmm. uh, all of it is very close. So we don't have original, like the original text, but we have like the copies that were made. So as it was going to churches, they would make copies for the other churches, all of that. So we have copies, and the copies are in very close agreement with each other. So we can say that it's very close to the original, even if there are changes throughout scripture, right? Um, all of the changes are very minor, even if there are any differences in scripts, in the manuscripts. It's very minor, nothing that is a doctrinal issue, nothing that is going to change what we believe. They removed any chapters like that, or I was asking. Uh, whatever we have will be whatever is closest to the original. So uh, whatever came into scripture was um, what was being used in the church on that at that time, right? So we can be very sure, confident of what is there in the in the text. Yeah, because in uh, ma'am, when compared to the Old Testament writing and New Testament writing, like we see Paul here, was this like easier to translate compared to that, or is it just about the same? Translate to English? Yeah. From no, be, no, because this is like uh, the new, because Old Testament writing, I thought maybe different from the New Testament writing where, where uh, Paul is writing, right? Mm -hmm. That's why I asked if it's. E okay. Hebrew to English. Now our current uh, Bibles are Hebrew to English. Yes. So uh, there is there are Greek translations they are, that are used to help in our uh, interpretation. But otherwise, it's Hebrew to English. So Hebrew is, um, I don't know, like, uh, you, maybe you should ask some Hebrew no, and Because, Greek like scholars, you see, in the English uh, language, right? Uh -huh. it, uh, when you still look at the 18th century, the way I'm speaking was different. Then you come back to how yeah. we are now, it's very, it is, the way I'm speaking is different. So I thought the same way might be that in the Old Testament, the way of like how they spoke would be different, how they wrote would be different. and. Uh, not like that, like, yeah, yeah, King James Version, like, uh, and Good News Version. You see, both it's very different, like that. So, uh, Hebrew um, is a little more descriptive, the language is a little more descriptive. It's not very strict in its uh, use of grammar and all of that. So, in those ways, there is a lot more interpretation when translations happen. Uh, and Greek is close to English also. in. Uh, the origin, like the the way the language has developed, it's uh, close to English, so it's easier to translate like word for word in those kinds of ways. Uh, but I think because we also have the Greek translation, which was being used by the Jews, we have a sense of what the Hebrew text was. So all of those things help in the translation process using the Greek translation um, and all of that. Uh, Ma'am, in the next chapter, we'll be looking a bit about how the Bible was formed. I'm just going straight to the revivalists. And... Yeah, we won't look at that in detail. Uh -huh. uh, it's just like, I think, like two lines. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the canon was set in place. Ma'am, uh, like, this question was uh, like, uh, we have, uh, like, you told that the, the letters that was uh, Paul written was uh, spread to all the churches. Like how we can know it was spread to all the churches because uh, 
he have wrote to certain church uh, addressing certain issues right mm-hmm. but how they can take the like letter that was written for corinth and apply to themselves like yeah so it's like how we are taking it right we it was written to corinth for their context for the issues they were facing but we are still looking at it and we are taking like what uh, are the main principles or what was the like what is paul's teaching on a certain doctrine or a certain issue what can we learn as a church today so there's that aspect of it but there's also the aspect of it was a shared culture and shared timeline even if they were in different places so in some ways they were they could take more because they were facing similar things they were facing persecution uh different things like that so there would be certain things that for them would be very relevant at that time uh for us we are learning more in principle um, so is there any uh, scripture to like back up uh there isn't scripture but there is history like uh so if we look at historical records of how the um and i can look more into it also tomorrow i can talk more about it but uh that's how the canon of the new testament was decided was because they had already accepted these books and letters within the church they'd already uh, been talking about it they'd already like uh, kind of agreed that it was authoritative so it was already there in the church they all, all they were doing was saying okay these are the books we are going to say come into agreement of these are going to be the canon uh, of scripture so there were other letters that were rejected because it was not uh, uh from paul i'm not sure but there were other books that were there uh, other letters that were there yeah that they considered as maybe we don't need to put this as part of the canon <laughs> So, ma'am, how does this letter working thing? Uh, th- how does uh, Paul letter letter? Because some like a passage you see the last passage he says that this letter is my own handwriting. Yeah. So, how did the process work? So, usually he was just narrating and somebody else was writing for him. So that last part of writing and saying this is my thing was kind of his stamp of this is original from me. It's not somebody else has written it and saying it's written by Paul. Uh, that was just to yeah. Okay. Verse 6 to 10. Verse 6 to 10. Verse 6 to 10. Okay. Mm. Okay. Ha, uh, this is where uh, the Holy Spirit didn't allow them to go to another place, right? So, um I think this is in one of his letters because he is saying it about his own journeys he says in every uh, place that we are going to uh, people warn us about uh, persecution and all that but I still continue to go there so we all have to find which letter it's in mm. yeah the holy spirit so for so this time being he didn't go but he went later on to these places in yeah to uh, galatia and astigia yeah yeah that the your book has a map of all the places he visited and how many times and in which journey he visited them to jan galatia we didn't look at that map but yeah Okay. So we'll move on to chapter 3. Okay, so uh we've finished the book of Acts which was like the early years after Jesus's resurrection and uh the Pentecost all of that in the uh, the church began right so from there until now several thousands of years 2000 years and more uh have happened and god has continued to move in these 2000 years uh and there've been 
different events and different people through whom God moved, right? And he has revealed new things. He's uh, brought restoration to the church and uh, restoring us to that original church in Acts of his Holy Spirit being poured out. Uh, so we are going to look at some of the main events. There's lots of things that have happened, but we obviously can't cover everything. So here we only look at key things that happened, uh, key people that were involved in it. So we look at the early church fathers. We look at the reformers uh, that uh, come after the whole Catholic church era. Uh, then we look at revivalists post the Reformation and then missionaries who have impacted um, the church. Uh, so all of these things are connected. So reformation to revival, to restoration of the church, to missions and church growth, all of those things are connected. Uh, where truth came back to the church through the reformation, uh, that uh, sparked revivals. Right, So truth brings revival, revival brings restoration, restoration brings missions, and missions brings church growth. Okay, so we look at how all of these things are connected. Uh, why it's important to do this? So we look at a few passages, Deuteronomy 4.9. Um, can somebody read that, please? Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. And teach them to your children and your grandchildren. So uh, we see here right at the start when God is establishing this relationship with the Israelites, this commandment to pass it on from generation to generation. Uh, because if God reveals himself to one group of people and it's not passed on, then each generation is trying to get the same revelation. Like there's no possibility of moving on in revelation and growing in revelation, right? So the idea is God has revealed himself. You pass this on to the following generations. And then there's place for greater revelation uh, for us to grow in our knowledge and understanding of God which is why scripture is so powerful for us. We can look back at it and we have this revelation of God from the time of creation uh, to even future, like the future, right? What we haven't yet seen. Uh, we have all of this knowledge that is revealed to us. Um, Joshua 4, 1 to 7. Can someone read that, please? And it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan, Mute that the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man from every tribe, and command them, saying, Take for yourselves twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood firm. You shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called twelve, who, twelve men whom he had appoint, appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for memorial to the children of Israel forever. Okay, so here we see uh, again God commanding uh, the people of Israel to do something, right? So in the previous one, it was to tell the succeeding generations, their children and their grandchildren, to pass on the stories. Here, it's like a physical structure that is being built to be a place of remembrance. So when people go back to that place, so when they see those stones, uh, there's an opportunity for that story to be retold. Uh, so apart from uh, speaking, there's also physical things um, so, like Sean asked, is there a physical church that we can go visit? Uh, so, the benefit of having that while there is a 
while there is an absence of the physical church, when there is a physical church, we go back and we can uh, retell the things that have happened in that place, uh, the things that God has done. So we'll go on to Psalm 44 and 4. If someone can read that. We have heard with our ears, O God. Our fathers have told us the deeds you did in their days, in the in days of old, you drove out the nations with your hand, but them you planted. You afflicted the peoples and cast them out, for they did not gain possession of the land by their own sword, nor did their own arm save them. But it was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your countenance. Because you, you favored them, you are my king, O God, command victories for Jacob. Okay, so here uh, it tells us when we look at what God has done in the past, then we have um, we have faith to fight the battles in our day, right? And we can believe God for things even greater than what we have faced. Uh, so that's why it's important for us to look at all of these things. And uh, apart from what is mentioned here, there are other things like. If we look at the heresies, we look a little bit at the heresies that were there in the early church. A lot of what is taught wrongly nowadays is similar to that. So it's so important for us to know what happened there. What? How did the people, how did the early church fathers respond? What did they teach the church to make sure that the church was following truth? Uh, when we know those things, then when we face the same things today, we don't have to go back and start searching for answers. We already have the answers to give uh, to wrong teaching that's coming into the church. Uh, so we'll start with this tomorrow. Um, and I'll give you the reference for what we talked about as well. Okay, Thank you, everyone. Thank you to those joined us on Google. Mm -hmm. I just take the mic so uh, it's for whoever's online and then they, it will help with their assignment as well. Uh, the first one is um, like their uh, spiritual journey. We have to write about the spiritual journey. But for there is no spiritual journey recorded or written of him. Like okay. the one that I choose. Who did you pick? Jonathan. Go forth. Huh? Go forth. Okay. There's nothing much about his uh, spiritual journey, like his encounters with God. Huh. There's nothing much. So. Okay. Okay, so um, I'll just look up. Um, I'll see if I can find some things, uh, and then I'll get back to you. Okay. Thank you. Is there any criteria that like uh, we have to do in this many slides, or uh, no? There's no slide limit. There's just a time limit. So if you minutes. whatever you can finish within five to seven minutes, I've given you. So how much ever you can finish within that time is fine. Yeah. And so, uh, feel free, like if if you feel that a PowerPoint presentation is going to help, then feel free to use it. Yeah. If, if there is any point, like so, we have to submit the PowerPoint, and then this doc also would uh, what we are presenting, what we are talking. You yeah. don't have to submit the document. Okay. If you want to submit a document, you can. Like in the class, when 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 this class is happening, in the starting, we have to share the screen of a presentation, right? Yeah. If you're doing a PowerPoint, you can join on Google Classroom and share and okay. present. Right. Yeah. So for those uh, on Google Classroom, those joining us online, uh, if on the day of your presentation, uh, you can be prepared to actually talk for those five or seven minutes. Uh, if you have a PowerPoint presentation, you can share that. If you don't have a PowerPoint presentation, uh, you can just uh, be prepared to like have your video on and to be able to speak for that time. Uh, I'll just have to find out about permissions for sharing screen. I'm not sure how that works for... 
everyone, but I'm sure we'll be able to figure that out. Ma'am, you're supposed to give uh, like, uh, a we can share a screen on this. So I'll just have to change. No. Yeah, no. meaning uh, like just like permission wise, it, no, no, no. you'll be allowed to share. Oh, okay, then it's fine. Then you can go in here. Okay. You had a question? No? Okay. Okay. Thank you.